recorded. Well, everybody will likely get a prompt that says, hey, this call is being recorded. And uh, I got 403, so here we are. So thank you all for coming to the AKR Forum in January 2023, our first forum of the year. I can't believe we're already towards the end of January. Um, for those who don't know me, I am Carly Bourne. I am the president of the Minnesota Kudo Reme and also the vice president of the American Kudo Reme. Unfortunately, Maria Sensei was not able to join us today. They don't have any internet again due to the weather in their area. So um, she asked me to kind of take this over and make sure that it still went forward. So here we are. Um, she does have a couple of reminders that she will be sending out as soon as she can get back online um, about upcoming events, such as our uh, North American IKYF seminar, which is going to be hosted by the Kudo Association of Canada in Vancouver, yay Canada, and, uh, and other events that are going to be open um, by the IKYF in, in Japan. Um, we also did hear that they are planning to do another video Shinsa for Shodan and Nidan again this fall. So stay tuned for information about all of that. Um, also, if there are folks who would like to volunteer to speak at the AKR forum or uh, volunteer again to speak at the AKR forum, uh, we have about enough speakers to fill out the first half of the year, but we're still looking for additional speakers for the second half of the year. Personally, I feel like this is a really great way for our community to kind of connect outside of our seminar things and everybody has something to learn and everybody has something to offer. So um, I would encourage all of you to consider that. And with that, I am going to turn this over to John. Um, who can definitely introduce himself, but let me move my window so I can tell you the title of his talk is The Everyness of Kudo, um, and I will give it to him. Thank you, John. And my, my active share screen button um, just told me that my the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So. Well, let me just change that for you. Thank you. Um. How about now? There we have it. It's almost like I know what I'm doing. Can you all see my screen? Oh, wait, I have to hit share first. You, you actually have to hit the button. Yeah, there you go. Now can you all see my screen? Good job. All right, terrific. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I am Carly's other half. Um, I'm, um, I'm the other teacher here in Minnesota, the Minnesota Kudo Renbe. Um, Carly and I began our study of Kyoto back in 1997 in Nagoka City, um, Niigata Prefecture. And um, we just celebrated our, our 25th year of, of practicing Kyoto uh, last year. So um, part of what I wanted to do today is not just share um, practical topics. There, there, will, there will be plenty of that. I'll be touching on a, on a lot of practical aspects of Kyoto as, as I go through this. But um, for the most part, um, I, I think we can all we can all open a book and, and, and read it ourselves and study it. Um, you're, you have other teachers that are are providing you with the information that you need and the guidance that you need to perform Kudo correctly. So I'm not really here to teach you in that regard. I'm here to share some experiences that I found extremely helpful. Some of them even um, inspirational and um, hope that those same experiences might resonate with some of you. They might help you along with your learning as, um, as you go forward as well. And basically um, go over how we developed our, our, our appreciation for Kudo and the attitudes with which we, we try to convey um, the, the, what we've learned to other people as well. So we have an archery adjacent, um, uh, adjacent slide here. There's an arrow in the picture, so it counts. But I mainly wanted to share this with you because this is something that's always resonated with me in terms of, of just learning in general. Um, Steve says, I studied with the Maharishi for many years and really didn't learn that much. But 
one thing that he taught me I'll never forget. Always, no wait, never, nope, wait, it was always. Um, that was the feeling I had in the dojo for many, many practices. I had people that were telling me constantly I was always doing something right or always doing something wrong. Sorry, I, was, I almost never got always doing something right. That I should never do something again. That I should just, um, every time I shot, I should do one of any hundreds of things. It was overwhelming. It was chaotic. It was confusing. Um, and somehow in the midst of all that, I actually learned something. So with that, I, I hope that's a, a sensation that some of you can relate to. But um, if, uh, if not, by the end of this talk, maybe you will. Here's where our Kudo experience began. As I said, in 1997, um, I started taking Kendo in the spring of 1997 in, um, in this large Shimin Taikukan City Gymnasium building, this complex that you see here. Um, and if you look at Carly's picture in the background, what you can see is the inside of the Kudojo. It was many months before I saw the inside of the Kudojo. I used to walk along this pathway along the front of the, uh, along the front of the building here after kendo practice, after about three hours of, of sweating in a very hot, humid um, part of Japan for several months between March and uh, about July or so. And, um, and I would walk down to the end of that corridor and the building I would see would be this Kudojo. Um, the Kudojo looked like a, a very peaceful place compared to the Kendojo. There would typically be one man that was uh, week after week opening the, the Shajo to get started shooting. And um, he would be silhouetted with the sun behind him a little bit like Carly is right now in, in her picture. Um, and he would he would calmly shoot a few arrows and then go collect them. And he was he was there kind of by himself. It was very, very solitary um, in nature for him at the time. He he liked to get there before before the crowd so he could get his own practice in. Um, with that, I um I got home from, from Kendo one day and I told Carly about it. And I said, This is just it, it looks spectacular. It's it's uh it's fascinating to to see the bows and all the, um, the unusual nature. I've been doing archery since I was about 12 years old. So I, I was very familiar with archery in general, but I'd never really seen anything like this. Um, and after a while, Carly decided that she wanted to try it out. And um, I approved. Kendo was kind of a, my thing at the time. I was only able to do it once a week, but it was, um, it was a, an intense, intense period of time. Um, and what we had found was that we weren't having much success joining things in Japan. We weren't having much success trying to get started with new activities unless they were sort of English related instead of Japanese related. Um, people wanted to learn English from us, even if that meant learning English from us while we were doing flower arranging or tea ceremony or, or something else like that, but they didn't really want to teach us anything Japanese. And um, we had to get some help. We had to um, ask some of our important friends to make introductions for, for things like Kudo. And that really was the only reason why we were, we were accepted in the beginning is because we had the right person talk to the right people and basically um, vouch for us. The, um, the gentleman who did that for us, um, his name was Kenshu uh, Uehara. He was my first English student in Japan. He was, uh, he's a Buddhist priest. And, um, and a doctor. Um, he, he had a, a lot of influence in the city, but mostly he had a great reputation. He was just a, a very kind man who, um, who reached out on our behalf to the um, Nagoka City Kudo Club and went to bat for us. He convinced them to take Carly first and another English teacher from, from town that um, also had an interest in studying at the time. Um, and there was a lot of reluctance. They really didn't want to teach us at first. They, uh, they didn't think Carly and this teacher would be around long enough. They didn't think they really had it in them to put the effort in to learn Kudo. Um, and there was um, just kind of the, a, a sense that they thought we might be wasting their time. Um, and in the case of the other English teacher, they were right. Within two weeks, she was gone. And I don't think she even made it to practice a third time. I think she made, made it twice and that was about it. 
Um, my keto journey had not begun yet, but Carly was all in. She, um, I, I was seeing a lot less of Carly because she was spending all her time at the dojo. So this is um, an, an overhead view of our, our Kudo Joe. The, um, the, somebody got a drone while we've been gone. And, um, and they're shooting across. You can see the, the Azuchi. You can kind of compare this to the picture in Carly's background. Um, it's a very industrial looking building, isn't it? it? It's not necessarily like a lot of the Kudo Joe that we've had. Um, we've, we've, many of us have had the good fortune to, to uh, experience um, as far as a traditional Kudo Joe goes. Um, and I'll show you why that is in just a, in a, in just a minute with, the, with these future slides. But um, in, in particular, the Kudo Joe here, um, a few noteworthy things is, if you notice in Carly's background, there's actually no waiting area. So without a waiting area, they can't host Shinsa because basically it's just an open floor that, um, that, that we, we walked across. So Carly and I, while we were studying in Japan, we never had the home dojo advantage of, of participating in a Shinsu. We always had to go somewhere else for that. One thing that they did do a lot of were Taikai though, a lot of tournaments. Um, and um, they were very popular, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of a few hundred to about 600 people would show up and spend an entire day just shooting their arrows and their groups and, and going on. And that was actually, Initially, what Carly and I thought we were preparing ourselves for was competition. This picture that you see here is actually the first picture of us taking, uh, of taking shots in Kudo that, that we know of to exist. Um, there were, we, we had been practicing for just barely a, a, a couple of months at this point. I had, um, I had received my uniform the, the day before the tie guy and had to, uh, had to learn to tie it on which is a particularly challenging um, proposition for me. And we had to go out there and prove ourselves um, a little bit probably early in our career. They tucked us at the back of the line. Interestingly enough, the, the gentleman who's cut off to the right in that picture is the first Hanshi that we ever met. Um, Igarashi Hanshi, uh, was one of the one of two Hanshi and Niigata Prefecture at the time when we lived there. Um, you may notice right away, it's something that a, a lot of people with keen eyes and, and uh, who are very particular in Kyudo would notice. Um, certainly it was something that even we noticed after, after a time there, that Higurashi Sensei's Keikogi isn't even Thai. It's his, the, the, the um, emo or, or loose on it. Um, I'm sure you don't have a full picture of him because what's really amazing about this man is just less than a year earlier than this photo was taken, he'd had a massive stroke. He lost control of three quarters of his body. Um, he had some use of his left arm and that was about it. Um, his hearing went as part of the stroke as well. And essentially he recovered through Kudo. He recovered because he wanted to get back to shooting. And within a year, the doctors told him he wouldn't recover. And within a year, he was back shooting at the dojo. And people let him do what he needed to do um, to be able to shoot in this time. The headband was something that he added to his um, ensemble as well, because he really didn't have the manual coordination to, um, to just take care of his hair at the time. Um, but he had a, a, a demeanor, he had a presence in the dojo. Everybody just instantly respected him. Everybody, he didn't need anybody's help. He didn't really accept anybody's help. I'm sure somebody could have walked up and tied that tie for him, but he wouldn't have any of that. The only concession they made for him was that they had a chair at the back of the dojo that he could sit in between shots. And that's the only concession he wanted. So other than that, you would never have realized that he had been sick during that time. So right off the bat, as we, um, as we are starting our keto journey, we're, we're finding ourselves just kind of in, in the presence of, of something truly inspiring, something that um, is, is just amazing to behold. And we wanted to 
um, we wanted to be a part of that. We wanted to be worthy of that, the attention that we were getting um, from, from our teachers. So it didn't really take long for both of us to find ourselves at the dojo quite a bit. Initially, when Carly started and the other teacher started, she was allowed to go once and then shortly after twice a week. And um, in, in my case, by the time I got there, Carly was going pretty much most nights of the week. I was essentially a Kudo widow. And I decided that I, I just wanted to go see what she was doing. So I was, I was teaching English, I was working at night a lot working in the afternoons a lot so our schedules we had kind of opposite schedules i couldn't get there to watch her practice very often um so i finally took a night off basically and carved out an opportunity to go see what this was that she'd been spending so much time on for about a month i think by that point and um and our dojo was very informal at the time which she didn't have a uniform yet most people shot in street clothes uniforms were actually not all that commonplace um, for, for people during regular practice, um, unless they were practicing for an event um, or, or, or a Shinza. But Carly, um, Carly at that point had already started shooting independently um, and she stood at the Honza and was getting ready to take her first shots for me. I sat off in Seiza by the, by the Kamiza where they had put me and was watching. And the woman who had become Carly's primary teacher walked over and um, and she walked over to me, but she looked at Carly and said, so is he gonna do it or what? And that's pretty much the, um, the beginning of my, my Kudo practice. I, I looked at Carly and like I said, I, Kendo was kind of a big deal. We just bought some very expensive armor. Um, and I asked her if it was all right. And she basically endorsed it by saying, I don't care, do whatever you want. And that's how my Kudo journey began. Right away, there were challenges. This is also our Kido Jo on a, an early winter day um, in Japan. You can see that there's quite a bit of snow there. The Yamichi was actually, um, was actually the place where the snow was removed to. Um, Niigata Prefecture is known for being in, in where the Japanese Alps are. It's, used, it's known for having the, the Kanto Plain throughout it. Nagaoka City is in the, in the plains we would still get several inches of snow in a single storm, sometimes feet of snow. And, um, and they had nowhere to put that snow. It didn't get very cold there. It certainly didn't get Minnesota cold. But it, got, um, it got down just to about freezing and below. So that snow would stick around. And on the streets, they would remove it with these little pipes, these little bubbling water pipes that would basically melt the snow. They were called shosetsu pipe. The shosetsu pipe would melt the snow. But they had to have some place to put some of the snow. There just, you couldn't have those, those pipes everywhere. So um, we would essentially start losing our Yamichi from December and by February, it would pretty much be gone. This was probably one of our earliest storms at the time. The blue truck there is, is what would be dumping the snow across our, our Yamichi. But the challenges that I'm talking about really weren't just the weather. One of the things that is challenging about Kudo is just the act of learning. And there's a, there's a quote in the Kudo manual that actually covers that to a T. It's in the Shaho Shagi no Kyon section. It's on page, 20, on page 58. It says, the human mind is disturbed by delusions, worldly desires, passions, and attachments, which are more often than not the result of the pursuit of experience and knowledge which summarized to me just means that learning will make you crazy. And learning Kudo in particular, I think, in the way that I had to learn it, certainly did that a lot. It was challenging all of the time for me at the beginning. I didn't understand what people were telling me. I didn't really know what I, whether I was being shown to do something a certain way or to not do something a certain way. And my Japanese was incredibly poor at the time. I was teaching English 10 hours a day. I had 
barely no opportunity to speak Japanese um, until I started doing judo, actually. And um, other than kind of watching Japanese TV, trying to trying to study on my own independently, I wasn't getting anywhere too quick. But I also didn't have a purpose for my learning of Japanese at that point. I didn't have a I didn't have a place to a place to study it or, or a place to practice it or a reason to practice it. And Kudo did give me that. But at first, again, I had lots of questions that I couldn't even ask. The internet was not a thing back in 1997, really. It was, a, it was a new thing. It was there, but it wasn't really all that great. Um, perhaps now, all this time later, it's still not all that great. But there weren't really any resources that I was aware of at the time. There were posters of the Shahu Hasatsu hung around the dojo. They were hung super high. Even if I could read the Japanese on them, they were, I'd need binoculars to do it. Um, occasionally, our teachers would point to Yumi Taro is what they like to call him. I assume that maybe that's something that um, that everybody calls him. I mean, you guys, I know you're looking at my slides, but if you can see, these are the posters that I'm talking about. And the guy, the model, the drawing, the illustration, who's shooting there was Yumi Taro. So Yumi Taro was kind of like our, our mascot. He was he, he was used as the, um, the, the um, example of what we should be following. We often wished he had clothes. And then beyond that, there were some personal things going on as well. This was really all on me. I wasn't really self-aware. I didn't really know what I didn't know. I actually thought that I was doing what my teachers were telling me. In spite of their disapproval, as I say on my slide here, they there were times when they clearly were letting me know that I wasn't doing it right. And I still couldn't figure out why that was. Um, I thought I, I insisted I was doing it right, not to them, usually to Carly. So she, she, she got the brunt of it, but, um, but at least I didn't embarrass myself in front of the teachers themselves. And then there was just true misunderstanding. There were times when I was sure that I finally understood what they were telling me and then would realize later that I actually had it backwards or just completely wrong. Like they had, they had told they had told me not to do something, and I thought they were telling me to do something instead. And I just went with that until I was ultimately corrected. And then there was the volume and capacity issue. I was hungry to learn keto. I was I was excited about it. I really wanted to take in just as much as I could. Um, but it turned out that as much as I could really wasn't as much as I wanted it to be, um, and it was hard to process it all. So. In a lot of respects, I was I was learning very slowly, and you might notice that I haven't mentioned certain resources that we're probably all very familiar with, like the Kyohan, um, because they weren't available to us at first. We actually nobody ever told us there was a Kyoto manual in Japanese or English at the time, so we had basically the words of our teachers to take us through and help us acquire all the knowledge that we needed to do for Shinsa, for Taikai. We actually were able to participate in some um, formal dojo biraki and um, learn some, um, learn a little bit of Shade during this time, even, um, even at our, our um, less experienced levels. When I first started, because my Japanese wasn't so good, they asked the woman in the first picture here, Kogure-chan, Kogure Naomi, to teach me. Um, she was an Idan. She was quite good, but she did not want to speak English to me. She did not really want to want, want to teach me Kudo. She was very um, giggly about the whole experience to the point where it just didn't work. She just couldn't stop laughing. The unfortunate thing was she was also one of my English students. And when she'd show up for English class, suddenly that became how she operated there too. So um, we didn't last long as teachers of each other at the time. She didn't last long as my keto teacher and I didn't last long as her English teacher. She went off to study with somebody else um, and that was ultimately for the best. But she did make an effort and um, I really truly appreciated the, the attempt that she made to do that with us. The next picture here is Hirasawa-sensei, and she really 
is the teacher that spent most of her, their, her time with Carly and I. Um, she was going on at the time, um, but she was highly respected in the dojo, quite possibly one of the most respected people in the dojo. Um, she had started Kudo a little bit later in life. I'm not sure exactly how late, but essentially she'd done Kendo all of her young life and um, got to a point where she didn't feel she could do Kendo as well as she wanted to be able to. So she decided to join Kudo and become a badass at that. And she really was. She really, um, she really, every single shot was absolutely beautiful from Hirosawa Sensei. Hirosawa Sensei, um, coincidentally, it was her husband that I would see after Kendo practice, opening the dojo and shooting on his own. They almost never practiced together, um, which Carly and I could relate to at the time. And because they were both in the dojo, we couldn't have two Hirosawa senseis or Hirosawa-sans. So she was Hirosawa Okasan, and he was Hirosawa Otosan. And throughout the rest of the presentation, I may lapse into calling her Okasan because that is what we called her. She was quite literally at the time, it felt like our Kudo mother. She was, she was giving birth to our Kudo while we were, while we were there in, our, in, in practice. Imai Sensei was actually the chief instructor. Um, and he was not one to be in the dojo much himself at the time. He didn't come to the dojo very often. He, um, he was among the more reluctant people to teach us. But as soon as he saw our enthusiasm and as soon as he saw the respect that we had for what we were doing and the people that we were doing it with and the effort that we were making and the way we were showing up to practice all the time, um, he started coming back to the dojo more. And he started taking us under his wing and teaching us as well which was truly great. Uh, Nanadan Kiyoshi at the time, um, again, chief, chief instructor, um, one, of the, one of the highest ranked people in our, in our prefecture at the time. And Aoki-san is the woman in Dai-san in the last picture. Uh, Aoki-san is something that I think every dojo would really be better off if they had. Aoki-san was the example. She was the one who could tell Imai Sensei that we were at practice every day because she was the only other person who was at practice every day. And much like Hirasawa Sensei, everybody thought Aoki-san shot very, very well. And we were directed to pay a lot of attention to how she shot so that we could emulate those behaviors. But like I said, it was kind of a, a tough experience for me. There weren't very many Japanese words I knew and the Japanese words I heard all the time often weren't very helpful. Some of them were even not very nice sometimes. Um, but as Steve Martin said, you know, always and never, those were frequently part of our of the conversation. I was often told I should always do that, that thing I just did or I should always do some other thing. It was hard to know at times which ones I should always be doing and which ones I shouldn't be. Same with Zen Zen. I should never do that thing I just did ever again, or maybe the topic had changed and it was something else entirely that I should never do. And then there were the people that made the effort in English to go, no, no, no. And that's definitely Oka Okasan. She would, she would um, never say it just once. Kind of like Sheldon knocking on the door in a Big Bang Theory. Something I just did or was in the process of doing wasn't right. Or maybe it was everything I just did, or maybe it was multiple things. It was hard to tell. There really wasn't any other explanation. It was just no, no, no. So it all felt wrong. And Chigao was the next thing that I would hear. Chigao just means wrong. So like no, 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 but when it was too much trouble to switch to English words. Somehow I still learned a few things in the dojo though. And these words became not just, some of them are definitely um, Hirosawa Kasan's um, direct quotes, but even those became something that everybody in the dojo would eventually use for us. So one of the first words I felt like I learned through Kudo was Rakuniste, which is relax. You can never relax enough. You can be too relaxed, but you can really never relax enough for Kudo. One of the next things I learned was, oh, Kiku, which just means bigger. Pull bigger. 
open bigger, 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 bigger. Next one's a little onomatopoeia for you. Doesn't really have a, an easy translation, but mune de pon. So mune de pon is like, um, pon is kind of like pop. Um, it's, it was used to talk about the release from the center of the chest, releasing from the center of a ch the chest with a pop every time. Um, Okasan really liked to like to say this to us quite a bit. Um, I occasionally will still hear it even when I'm just shooting. It'll just be some latent memory that'll bubble to the surface. And, um, and it's often not just the pop of your chest, but the pop of the target as well. Those two things, when, you, when, the, when the chest pops right, the target usually pops right too. And then the last one, which was the highest form of praise that I ever received. Urasawa Kasan would say, Pachigu. And to her, that was just very good. So um, over time, between the words I heard and the lessons I learned, I started to piece together how I should be doing what it was that I was doing. I started to get more Pachigu and less Chigao. Um, which was nice. And at the time, I felt like I had just taken in everything that they had to offer, that I had opened myself up to the teaching and um, and allowed them to allowed all those lessons to get through to me. Um, I wasn't I still didn't have the conceit to think I was very good by any means, but I but I did think that I was at least starting to get it. And it turned out I was both completely wrong and a little bit right about that. Um, because at some point we discovered that there was a Kudo manual. And the way we discovered this is the, those Yumitado posters that I mentioned, somebody one day showed up and this was very near the end of our time in Japan. It was very, very near um, when we left the country. Um, it was right before our Sandan Shinsa, I believe. And they had a fold out piece of paper, a gatefold, if you will, that had um, had the Yumitaro diagrams of the Shaho Hasetsu in English. And we just about fell over because we'd really never seen anything about English or anything about Kyudo in English before. Um, it was it was not quite exactly what appears on page 127 to 133 of the English Chohon today. It was probably from an older version, we're thinking. Um, we weren't allowed, we were allowed to look at it in the dojo. We weren't allowed to take it with us. We weren't allowed to make copies of it. Um, we had to give it back, was pretty much the first thing they said to us as they gave it to us. And um, Carly was actually in a conversation with, um, with Kogure-chan um, about this. And she's just like, where did this come from? And Naomi Kogure mentioned, the, um, mentioned that Oh, it looks like it's from the English Kyoho, the English Kudo manual, which was like there's a there's an English manual and there's a there's a manual for Kudo. There's a there's an English version of it. Um, so within a, within a couple of weeks, we finally had the Kyoho, and we finally had some context around all the things that we had been shown and taught over time, and we realized there was so much more. Um, than, than what we had been able to get from the, the, the teachings at the time. Um, and it gave us things that we could engage our, our teachers in um, further dialogue about. It gave us things that we could ask more questions about. Um, and it really spurred us to dig deeper into what Kudo really is. The Kudo manual can be very inspiring for that purpose. So. As I said, though, even after, after getting this and, and devouring it and reading it probably faster than I've read any book in the last 30 years, um, I still didn't, I, when I got through it, it's like, wow, there's just a lot more stuff I don't understand now. So I kept reading. And then I thought about it as I was re reading, and I started digging deeper into the Kudo manual. And I thought about all the things that the teachers had told me over time. And I said, I wonder if it's true. I wonder if everything about the shooting is something we have to be doing all of the time. 
I wonder how many things are really that there are that we should never be doing. How many things should we not do in Qdo? And I thought, all right, well, let's let's see how many of those things are in the Qdo here. So in, in one of my readings, basically from 1999 until our first son was born in 2005, I would I would start reading the Qdo and I'd get to the end of it, I'd start reading it again. I don't really know how many times I read it between 1999 and 2005. I know I've read it every few years since then. Um, primarily, I use it as a, as a reference material now, but I do still occasionally just find it very helpful to pick up the Kyohon and read it cover to cover again. Um, but as I started reading it, I started asking myself, oh, geez, did I, did I, did I get it wrong all, all along? How, how many times were we always told to always do something or never do something? And if you look in the Kyohon, the word always is only mentioned 17 times. The word never is only mentioned 12 times. That didn't seem right. So I started looking into other things. So superlatives, things that you're told to do different times, right? Est words, est words like highest and greatest, all right? Things like most. That's just another way of saying you have to do it always, right? It's, it's the most important. It's the um, it's the noblest way to do it. It's the best way to do it, right? Those, those sorts of words. Um, those are used 30 times. The word every only appears 15 times. Most and mostly only appears 21 times. And I thought, oh, I've got it all. They use all, all the time, right? 60 times. That's a lot of appearances, except when you think about it, all Nippon Kudo Federation is probably where more than half of the alls in the Kudo Manual appear. So I looked a little bit deeper into the words that are in the Kyohon and said, all right, obviously these, these things, these 30 to 60 things, if you wanna take that number are pretty important. They feel pretty strongly about that. But it felt like even the Kyoto manual, read after read, was just a constant list of things that you had to do all the time. The things that you had to do with every shot, every time you entered the dojo, every time you sit, every time you stand. So I started looking for other words and I finally struck soul, which is entirely coincidental as far as my, um, my, my pie graph goes here. Should is the gold color. The word should appears in the Kyohon 266 times. That is, that is the verb of choice when providing direction in the Kyohon for things that we are supposed to do. What I found interesting though, is that there really isn't a lot of negativity in the Kyoto. There aren't a lot of things that they tell us not to do. The must nots, should nots, and do nots add up to less than 10%. They're basically about, uh, actually a little bit more than 10%, I'm sorry. That's uh, about 50 times combined. So you've got should 266 times and about 50 times for the nots. So I think that the Qdo manual tells us we should do these things. And it's interesting that the number of things that we should not do or must not do are quite low. Um, and it's also interesting that the Kyoho positively focuses on the correct way to do something, which is something that we would probably all be better off if we could do ourselves. So what was really important where were the highest concentrations of those words? And my students that are on today will know that this is a part of the um, a part of the Kyohon that I emphasize in class quite a bit. Um, it's because it is a part of the Kyohon that I found to have probably more far-reaching um, implications for all of your all of the all of what you do in the dojo than even the Shavu Hasetsu does. I don't find this, I don't find anything really of greater or lesser importance when it comes to Kyohon. Um, I'll just say that these eight underlying principles, they are the everyness of Kyoto. They are everywhere in the Kyoto manual. And I'll demonstrate that here in just a second. But if you don't know what these are, you should take some time to go look at pages 30 and 31 and absorb what these eight underlying principles are. Because as I said, they appear everywhere. So the first one and the last one 
I think they 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 don't really benefit from shorthand. So I'm just going to read them to you. The first one, of course, is to commit to memory the correct body posture and the movements of standing up, sitting, and moving forward and backward to keep Yoshintai to become the body animated with light. Dikitai, kitai. The second one is to keep the correct form of the torso in every movement and posture. Those are goodies. Those are goodies, not just what you do between Ashibumi and Yugamai anymore, right? It's part of everything. Take care with the use of the eyes. That's the description in the English Joe Hone for Mezukai. Take care with the use of the eyes. Keep movements in harmony with the correct breathing. And I'll go so far as to say that Ikiai is not just for movements. You should be breathing all of the time. Every movement should be supported by the hips. Every movement should be supported with the hips. There's one of those everys. Movements need to have remaining spirit or form, manshi. All movements depend on timing or ma. And in the beginning stages of training, do every movement keeping to the fundamentals. And although it is better to allow the movements to be rough rather than too controlled, we should still aim to hold to the essential point. So those are the eight underlying principles. And if you look at them on page 30 and 31 of the Kyohon, it kind of feels like it's just an introduction to the five postures and eight movements, the Kyohon Tai. But it really is more than that. If you look further and get past page 31 and actually past page 55, which is a pretty big chunk of the book, right? You get past those postures and movements, you're going to see that those eight principles are essentially what are used to describe all of those postures and movements. Not all eight principles are covered in the Kyohon for every posture and every movement. They're not all mentioned. For example, the, um, the sitting in a chair doesn't really mention ikiai or ma, okay? But even though it doesn't mention it, I, I guarantee you that ikiai, again, you should be breathing all of the time, um, and mai are something that you should be paying attention to even when you're sitting in a chair. These principles also overlap and some of them are repeated entirely in the Shaho Shagi no Kihon on pages 56 to 59. They're mentioned throughout the textual descriptions of the Shaho Hasetsu that follow on pages 59 to 74 and on those diagram pages that I mentioned before, 127 to 133. That's full of information about, or, or full of mentions of Mezukai, Ikiai, the working of the spirit. All of those, all of those chapters of the Kyohon are full of, of mentions of these eight principles. It's definitely part of the explanations for the shah, uh, for the shade, mochimato shade, hitotomato shade, yawatashi, all of it. When they start talking about what you're doing in the dojo, they're always talking about it in relation to these eight principles. So we're getting pretty much through the entirety of the book. It's even part of recovering from shitsu that follow the um, the explanations about the shade and the and the enzu no dosa. It's essentially part of everything that you're doing while you're doing Kudo. So please keep that in mind as you're going through that those underlying principles aren't just for the postures and movements. I'd actually challenge you guys to try to find a single page where they're talking about the archer. They're talking about what the person is doing, who's performing a shot, who's taking a shot, who's performing a ceremony that doesn't mention one of these eight. I'm pretty sure the only pages that don't mention it are the pages that talk about the equipment. So you have to ask yourself, do you have to do everything? Or I had to ask myself, do I have to do everything? The short answer to that is yes. You have to do all those things all of the time at every moment in the dojo. Obviously that's a tall order. Not everybody can do it. Not even people who've been practicing for 25 years or 50 years can do it. Some of us can do it for a while, then we can't do it anymore. But with 
those eight principles, I would actually advise people, I do this um, now, make a mental checklist. Use those eight things, as, go through them as you're doing anything in the dojo. Don't do it for everything that you're doing in the dojo. That would be way distracting and take lots of time. But think about those eight things while you're just standing at the homes and getting ready to take a shot. And go through the checklist and say, am I doing, what, how am I doing this? How am I breathing? How far am I away from the people around me? How fast am I moving? Um, you know, how am I feeling? What, what spirit am I projecting? What spirit am I feeling inside? Am I doing this correctly? You go down that checklist for each thing that you're doing and you're bound to find something that you weren't doing as correctly as you thought. So work on doing it the correct way until it becomes natural. Keep working on, on it's really the first of the eight principles anyway, right? Um, try to strive to do everything to, in, in the correct manner. And then try to improve every time you shoot. And again, you might not be able to do everything. Maybe not ever, I don't know. But at points, sometimes there's going to be, there's going, there's going to be moments where you're doing far more than you ever were before. And just keep building up. There's always more room to grow. You can always do more of the everything. And be open to the lessons that you're receiving around you. Those lessons might be from your teachers. They might be from your, <clears throat> excuse me, they might be from your classmates. Um, they might be things that you're realizing yourself. That should be, that should not be a neglected part of, of what you learn in the dojo is, are the lessons that you teach yourself, the lessons that you figure out on your own. The quote that I started off with is actually a little bit longer. There's a little bit more to it. I studied with the Maharishi for many years and really didn't learn that much. But one thing that he taught me, I'll never forget. Always, no, wait, it was never, no, wait, it was always carry a litter bag in your car. If it doesn't, it doesn't take up much room and if it gets full, you can toss it out the window. Obviously that joke is, uh, you know, not really very sensitive about littering and things like that, but I, I do look at this more as a, as a, um, as kind of a, an image of of what learning is like. Every time somebody teaches us a lesson, every time we try to learn, we either take something away from it or we throw it away, and we have to decide as individuals which things we're going to take away and which things we're going to throw away. Sometimes that's going to be a matter of our own limitations. How much can we take away? How much can we learn at a given moment? But if you keep trying to learn more, progress can be endless. You can keep learning. Which brings us to the long game. This is actually um, our Enteki Joe in between the two buildings that, uh, that were pictured on my first my earlier slide of our shajo. Um, beautiful spring day in 1999. We we're having our, our Enteki Taikai and, uh, and, and doing a little bit of um, Hanami, a little bit of flower viewing. Um, and this was towards, again, this was our last few months in Japan. We were, um, we were trying to figure out what Kyudo was gonna be like for us after we got back. Um, we fortunately were able to discover the Northern California Kudo Federation uh, upon our arrival in Monterey. We found excellent teachers there and excellent comrades in Kudo, people that, um, that we, uh, we grew to love and continue to love to this day. We've learned so much from so many of them. Um, and through the NCKF, we were able to branch out and um, start attending seminars and meet people in the rest of the American Kudo Renme as well many of you and we want to thank you all for all of the lessons that you've taught us over the course of the um the 25 years that we've been doing kudo um when i say it's a long game it's a game for us it's not going to end until we do we are just um we are just going to keep doing kudo as long as we possibly can um as long as the the cities will keep letting us use their gymnasiums here in Minnesota as long as the IKYF and the ANKF keep sending Hanshi and, and other people over here to teach us and, and inviting us to Japan to learn as well. Um, there are so many more lessons that we have to learn. 
try to make sure that while you're doing this, you don't lose sight of the people that you're doing it with. This was our last day in, in um, Japan, quite literally. This was um, the last thing we did was a Kimpu Jinja type bag. Kimpu Jinja, the Kimpu shrine in, uh, in Nagoka City, was um, was a, uh, and I'm so, unfortunately I'm using it in, in the past tense because it burned in the years since we left, but it was a, an annual event that, um, that the city absolutely loved. We had this unusual target because we were shooting 50 meters at it um, instead of the standard 25, so it was slightly bigger. We scored points based on the um, color that you hit, and we had gone from having to kind of fight our way in to joining this pedo group to being fully accepted. Imai Sensei insisted on being part of our three person team for this last Taikai, for this last event. And um, every single person in this picture is somebody that we practiced with. Except for Yanagi Machi-san's little girl in the orange hat. She, she wasn't quite doing keto at the time. Um, but everybody else here imparted something to us. They left us with something. We took something away from the experience with them and, um, and have been trying to be worthy of it and, and share it with everybody else ever since. So for us, it comes down to these three things. For me, at least, it comes down to these three things. Self-improvement. Shooting need not be a repetitive process. Should always strive to improve even upon correct and proper technique because no matter how good it is, it can be better. Enrichment, make sure that you're getting something out of your practice and do your best to give something back. But let your practice fulfill you. We have a lot of people come through our doors that are incredibly frustrated by keto. They don't seem to be enjoying themselves at all. And I'm not picking on anybody in particular or too many people. It's just we have some people that, that for which keto is very, very hard and they feel it and they want to do well. I hope that those people will from time to time at least reflect and see how keto has actually helped them instead of focusing on the, the hardness of it. So allow you <clears throat> to feel that joy, experience it. Don't let it slip past unnoticed. That's it guys, that's all I have. I, um, I put a couple of quotes here that, um, that I, I wanted to share with you. Um, what you know will change as you progress. And what your teacher knows will change as they progress. We're all continuing to grow as we do this. So I hope I helped some of you with some things today. Um, Imai Sensei leaves you with a little bit of Shin Zen B. It's back here on my right shoulder as well. Um, I, I, I think that what I've learned through, um, through this process of, of getting ready to talk to you all today is that even with this time um, spent, even with all the time I've spent on um, on reading the Kyohon and and preparing, it still has it still has lessons to give up. It still has new discoveries to make. So um, again, just pay attention to all the lessons. Take advantage of all the reference materials that you have available to you. Don't take them for granted. Um, we I certainly appreciate that the ANKF is taking the time to make that volume available to us. So make use of it. That's all I have. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. Bye. That was um, quite nostalgic for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have a moment for a little bit of Q&A if anybody has? Oh, of course. Yep. If you have questions, feel free to unmute or put them in the chat and we will facilitate. It's a lot to think about for sure. Um, and some of it was a very personal experience, quite a bit of it, but hopefully it's something that um, people can extrapolate from. All right. I if really there... appreciate it. You... Go ahead, Ed, Sensei. Oh, okay. I really appreciated John sharing y'all's experience in Japan because so many of us, even though we've been there a time or two or three, didn't begin there. And it's a whole different world. And so this was very enlightening. Thank you very much.
It is. I And I'll, I'll confess, when we first got here, I found the seminars to be wonderful, absolutely wonderful, but kind of bizarre how we'd all get to practice together and be in our shooting groups before the Shinsa. And, yeah. and like I said, it, it felt a little bit like, you know, the home dojo, where, whereas the most challenging part of, of doing of, of doing Kudo those couple of years that we were in Japan was we didn't practice every practice like we were getting ready for a test. That was not something that our dojo did. Like I said, it was very informal. You get out about a week or two out from your test and they'd say, all right, it's time to practice. And then a couple of nights before the test, they wouldn't let you practice because they didn't want you to, um, didn't want you to, to basically have, have your mind focused on all, all the problems that you were having before the test started. They wanted you to go into the test with sort of a, a fresh light. So the only couple of nights that we'd ever get off from practice was immediately bored before Shinsa. Um, so making that adjustment, I, I, to be honest, I, every time I take a Shinsa here, I feel like I'm, I'm proving to myself that I can do it a completely different way. Thank you for that comment, Ed Sensei. Okay. Well, thank you again for everybody who was able to join us today. Um, I will be saving this recording, which I'm going to stop about now.